a mini lecture on justice. At this part in the course module, you should have just learned about the different types of trust and how these different types of trust influence whether or not we will trust an authority figure at different points in time. So now that we know that there are different types of trust, we are going to dig into what it is that makes somebody um, display trustworthiness. So when employees are looking at an authority figure like a manager, a supervisor, a CEO, they are going to watch what that authority figure does and how they behave in order to form trust perceptions. And this idea that we are looking for behavioral evidence is called justice. So we can define justice as the perceived fairness of an authority's decision making. So in other words, we as employees are going to look to our supervisors and our managers, we're going to watch how they make decisions, what processes they use to make decisions and determine outcomes. And by watching that, we will decide whether or not we think that person is trustworthy. So there are actually four types of justice that a manager or an authority figure can um, enact. The first is called distributive justice, and this has to deal with outcomes. So how are outcomes divided and are they done in a way that is perceived as fair? The second type of justice is called procedural justice, and this is driven by the process. So rather than looking at the outcomes, we look at how a decision was made and whether or not the steps or processes involved in that decision are perceived as fair. The third type of justice is called interpersonal justice, and this is going to be uh, respect driven. Essentially, it says, how did the authority figure treat me and did I receive fair treatment um, during the decision making process during our interactions? And the last type of justice is called informational justice, and uh, just as the name implies, this is going to be information driven. So this will look at how much information were individuals given during the decision making process, uh, were they given fair amounts of information, uh, or perhaps were they left in the dark on key decisions. So we're going to go into each type of justice um, in the next couple of slides, and you will see that with each type of justice, there are different rules that an authority figure can follow or can enact. Uh, and by following these rules, it will help them to be perceived as um, more fair and just in their decision making. So again, we're going to start by focusing on distributive justice, which focuses on the outcomes of a decision. So it looks at what happens, uh, what outcomes are an employee given uh, or earned, and are they perceived to have been distributed fairly across employees? So for instance, you might think about um, decisions being made about bonuses or about um, end of year salaries or rewards, right? How are those decisions made and are the, are the outcomes of those decisions fair? So there are three different types of rules or norms that can be followed uh, related to distributive justice. So the first is called the equity norm. And the equity norm basically says that um, we are going to give more outputs to those with the most inputs. So this idea of equity should sound pretty familiar to you because we just described equity theory uh, in chapter six, right? So um, here individuals look at their own outputs to inputs and compare those to others' outputs to inputs, uh, and that helps them to make um, decisions about how motivated they are. So this idea of equity also carries over into um, justice, where individuals are going to perceive an outcome as more fair if more outputs are given to those people with the most inputs. 
Uh, this particular norm is going to be perceived as the fairest choice when the goal in the organization is to maximize productivity. So when we're really focused on individual performance and individual contributions, using the equity norm is going to be um, the most fair way to distribute outcomes. So as an example, let's say that you are a sales employee and it's your job to get new customers and sell them uh, as much um, product as possible. So at the end of the quarter, the most fair way to distribute outcomes would be to look at all of the sales employees and the employees that sold the most would get the highest bonuses and the employees who sold the least would get um, the lowest bonuses according to this equity norm. The other norm uh, that we can follow according to distributive justice is called the equality norm. And this basically says that everybody gets the same outcome regardless of their outputs or inputs. So everyone is going to get the same um, the same outcome. In general, this is perceived to be the fairest choice, particularly for team-based work. Um, because teams are um, comprised of multiple individuals and everybody is contributing to the final product, it can be really hard to try to tease apart who contributed what to the team. Uh, and so it just tends to be the case that it is perceived as the most fair uh, in a group setting that everybody gets the same reward or everybody would get the same punishment um, because they're working as a team, they're working together, and it can be hard to distinguish those individual contributions. And the last uh, norm that could be followed according to distributive justice is the need norm. So this says that outcomes are distributed based on individuals' needs. Uh, this means that some individuals will get more than other individuals, uh, but again, it depends on who needs more. So for instance, um, as just a, you know, popular press example right now, there is talk about distributing um, income checks, right? to families in the United States who are in need. And so you can get a stimulus check of up to $1,400. Uh, but not everybody is going to get $1,400. So the people that have the most or the greatest financial need are going to get the most money. Individuals that don't have a financial need um, are going to get less money or in some cases, no money. So the outcomes that we're giving, in this case, the stimulus checks, are dependent upon um, who needs more resources at that time. In the workplace, we might consider the ways that we reduce or um, organize somebody's workload. Uh, so in particular, we might distribute workload um, unevenly across employees so that new employees have to do less work while employees who have been at the organization longer would do more work. Uh, and this is actually the a stance that WVU takes in the management department for faculty. So I'm an assistant professor, which means I'm on the newer end of faculty. And as a result, uh, it's really important that I do well in my teaching and I do well in my research. So the department lets me do less service-based work uh, compared to individuals who've been in the organization for longer periods of time. So the expectation is that when you're new, we're going to ask you to do less. That way you can be uh, more productive in the areas we really need you to be productive in. And then over time, as somebody gets promoted from an assistant professor to an associate professor, we would then increase their workload so that the longer you've been there, the more work you do. So again, distributive justice can follow three different approaches, and these approaches are going to be dependent on the work environment and dependent upon um, how work gets done. So is it individually or is it team-based? 
The second type of justice is called procedural justice, and this has to do with how fair the decision-making process is. So it's not concerned with the outcome, but just whether or not the process was fair. So imagine that you are going up for a promotion, and you find out that you did not get the promotion. Uh, employees might be less upset if they believe that the process itself was fair. So if you think you were judged fairly and you were evaluated um, in an unbiased fashion, but you just didn't get the promotion, you're probably not going to be very upset compared to if you think you were somehow biased or discriminated against in the process and that it wasn't fair. So there are actually six different rules that are associated with procedural justice. So we need to follow each of these rules in order for our decisions to be perceived as fair to our employees. The first is called the employee voice rule. And so you are familiar with this term voice. It is a citizenship behavior, uh, but it's also really important for a lot of concepts um, that we've talked about in this class. It basically says employees want to have the opportunity to give input and to share their feedback uh, or have a say in the process. So it's really important that we involve employees in our processes as we're creating them and allow them an opportunity um, to speak up during that process. The second rule is called the correctability rule. And this basically says uh, that we've put some kind of provision in place to go back and fix any errors we might have made. So if there was a mistake made in the process, is there an opportunity to go back um, and fix it? So this is generally perceived as more fair rather than a decision being made and there's no opportunity to ever um, take back that decision. So you might think about in the court system in the United States, we have an appeals process. <clears throat> so if for some reason we feel like um, a de court decision did not go our way, is there an opportunity to go back and appeal it? Um, this also occurs in um, academic settings. So if there is um, uh, a student gets a, a grade that they don't perceive to be fair, uh, we do have a process in place where students can appeal those grades. So it's an opportunity um, to allow correction to be made if possible. The next rule is called the consistency rule, and this says that we are going to be consistent in the ways that we carry out our decision-making process, and we're going to apply those um, consistent rules and standards to every person regardless of who that person is. So um, in this class, when you turn in assignments, your assignments are graded uh, using a rubric, and that rubric is used for every single student. So if, for instance, I only used the rubric for some students uh, and for other students I just gave them grades based on what I thought they deserved, um, that would not be following consistency rule and that would probably make the process of me um, grading your assignments look unfair. So we have to apply the same standards across all employees or across all situations. The accuracy rule says that we are going to base our decisions on um, information that is accurate. So we're going to make sure that we have taken care to only include facts uh, and information in the process uh, that are accurate and true. Uh, if we use information that's not true, that of course could lead to bad decision making um, or flawed biased decision making. The representativeness rule um, basically says that when making decisions, we are going to take uh, the experiences and the perceptions or perspectives of all employees into account when, when making a decision or making um, some sort of process. So for instance, let's say that an organization has meetings every Thursday at 3 p.m. Well, any employee that is a parent might not be able to then attend that meeting if they have to go pick their children up from school. 
And so uh, when making decisions, we want to be sure that our decisions are representative and inclusive of all employees and that we're really able to see things through um, our employees' perspectives, um, all employees' perspectives. So it's just um, requiring us to look look at our decision-making processes through the lens of different um, diverse groups and making sure that we represent them fairly in the process. And then the last is called the bias suppression rule. The bias suppression rule um, basically says that we take specific steps, uh, we take purposeful steps to remove bias from our decision making. For instance, a lot of organizations, when they look at uh, resumes, they actually will not look at an individual's name. So if you're filling out information online, uh, they might get you know, your credentials and your work experience, but actually they won't have access to your name. And this helps to suppress bias because from somebody's name, we can generally determine if, um, you know, they're male or female, or we can generally determine perhaps if they have um, a Caucasian American sounding name, or perhaps if their name sounds like um, an individual who might have a different racial ethnic background. And so just by trying to take out some of that information, we can suppress biases that might impact our decision making. Um, so these four rules here, consistency, accuracy, representativeness, and bias suppression are really important for ensuring that when we make decisions, we are doing so in a way that is protective of groups, that is not discriminatory towards groups, uh, and helps to ensure that the process really is fair um, for all individuals. So I think this is an important um, time to focus on whether or not we care just about the outcomes, right? So if you get a promotion, don't you just care that you got the promotion? Or if you didn't get a promotion, do you really care about the process? Or do you mostly just focus on the fact you didn't get the promotion? Well, research tells us that procedural justice and the process that was used to make a decision um, actually influences our perspectives on distributive justice, whether or not those outcomes are perceived as fair. So let's say you were going up for a promotion and you get the promotion. That's a good outcome. You got what you wanted. Um, in this instance, you're probably unlikely to go back and really look at the process that was used to determine that you got the promotion, right? You're unlikely to question, um, what was the process you used? Tell me how you came to this decision. How is it that you thought I was the best, right? We generally just, um, in this situation, take the good outcome. We take the promotion or we take the bonus uh, and we're happy with that and we have no more questions. However, um, in the case that you did not get the promotion, this would be a bad outcome. It would be an outcome you weren't expecting or um, didn't desire. In this situation, procedural justice actually becomes much more important. Um, so here, employees that get bad outcomes, so perhaps they've been written up or they don't get a promotion or they don't get a salary um, or they find out that they're not going to be um, moving to the new location, whatever it is, they're going to be more likely to go back to the policies and ask questions when they get a decision that they don't like. So in this instance, it's really important for an organization to demonstrate consistency, right? We use the same process to evaluate all individuals, uh, or we use the same process across situations, uh, that our information is accurate, that we've taken steps to minimize bias in the decision-making process. Uh, if you think about the motivation case study we did last week, looking at um, our employee, uh, Brett and why he did not get uh, his promotion, this is going to be really important for continuing to motivate uh, Brett's performance even after he didn't get the promotion. Uh, we have to be able to go and explain our process and how the process was made in order for employees to feel as though it was fair. So if we can clearly line, um, clearly outline the criteria we used and the information we used and the process we used to come to a decision, more than likely our employees will perceive that we've um, done a good job, that we've been fair in the process, even if they don't like the outcome that they got. 
The third type of justice is called interpersonal justice, and this has to do with um, the extent to which an employee perceives that they've been treated fairly by um, authorities, and again, being treated fairly in an interpersonal way. So have they been respected, or um, are they perhaps demeaned or mistreated um, by an authority figure? So in order to show interpersonal justice, there are two rules that authority figures should follow. The first is called the respect rule. And this basically is, you know, think about um, the golden rule when you were in um, elementary school, we were all taught to be kind to others, right? Uh, this is essentially what the respect rule says. We're going to treat employees in a dignified and sincere manner. So we're not going to go out of our way to embarrass them. We're not trying to humiliate anybody. Um, if we have to correct their behavior, we're not going to shout at them and scream at them in front of the whole office. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one professional meeting with them. Uh, where we're going to be critiquing perhaps their performance, but not critiquing them as a person. So it's really important uh, that we demonstrate respect for all individuals, even if they're behaving in a way that we don't appreciate or that we don't value in the organization. By trying to correct someone's behavior and treating them in a dignified way, we're going to demonstrate respect and they're going to perceive um, that they've been treated fairly in an interpersonal way. So um, just as another example, uh, there have been times in my class that I've had to address students who have plagiarized or um, cheated on assignments. And so in those cases, there are times where I've had to fail students on assignments or even fail them in the class for their behavior. Uh, but whenever making those decisions and interacting with students, um, rather than shouting at them and telling them, you know, what a failure they are, how disappointed I am, um, it's more or less my stance to just explain why that behavior is not appropriate and how it hurts them, but also hurts the class and, and goes against the values of the institution. So in this case, a student might not like the outcome, but they can perceive that they've been treated fairly by me um, from an interpersonal standpoint. The second rule that needs to be followed in order to display interpersonal justice is called the propriety rule. And this essentially says that an authority figure is not, um, they're going to refrain from making any improper or offensive remarks. So uh, an authority figure is not going to use crude language. They're certainly not going to um, engage in any hostile, harassing behaviors. If we think about sexual harassment and making comments about someone, uh, what their body looks like, what they might be wearing, um, any of those types of comments would certainly break the propriety rule. So not only are we going to treat people in a dignified way, but we're going to um, refrain from uh, making any co comments that are improper, harassing, bullying, etc. These two rules, um, when we follow them, we're able to demonstrate interpersonal justice. We're able to show an employee that we treat them fairly interpersonally. Unfortunately, if we don't follow these rules, uh, it can result in something we call abusive supervision. So abusive supervision occurs when an authority figure or a leader displays hostile verbal and nonverbal behaviors. So someone who yells all the time, maybe they slam the door or slam their phone or they break something, right? This is considered abusive situation. It's certainly a hostile environment um, for employees. And unfortunately, it does occur in the workplace. Um, recent evidence has shown that about 15% of employees are victims of abusive supervisors. And while 15% might sound sort of low, when you think about the millions of people that are employed in the workforce, 15% um, of millions is um, thousands and thousands of employees um, being affected by abusive supervision um, each year. And we know, um, again, from research that abusive supervision has some really negative and serious consequences for our employees. So these individuals are going to be much more likely to experience strain, thinking about, um, you know, having headaches or having gastrointestinal issues, feeling depressed or feeling anxious, um, maybe um, crying. I mean, all of these are different types of ways we might demonstrate strain. 
Abusive supervision also contributes to burnout. So employees are going to be less likely to want to stay with their organization. They're going to feel just complete emotional, psychological um, exhaustion from working in an environment that is so hostile. And abusive supervision also results in increased counterproductive behaviors among our employees. So when an, a supervisor treats you unfairly and they're hostile and rude and, and harassing, that is going to result in employees more or less engaging in behaviors that take away from organizational effectiveness. So it's really important um, that we display interpersonal justice, not only because it will um, enable individuals to think that they've been treated fairly, but it also will have some um, positive outcomes related to their well-being. The last type of justice that we're going to talk about is informational justice. And this has to do with the extent to which an employee believes that the communication uh, that they received during a decision-making process uh, was fair. So are employees receiving information? Are they being communicated with? Uh, or are they sort of being left in the dark? This would be really important when organizations are making big decisions. So if they're going to be engaging in layoffs, if they're going to be merging, uh, perhaps an organization is um, acquiring a new brand, right? Any really large decisions that are being made that have a chance to affect employees and their um, employment and their well-being, employees are going to want communication about those decisions. So there are two rules that we can use in order to display informational justice. The first is the justification rule. And this basically says that we're going to fully explain the decision-making process and the outcomes. So we're going to work through um, all of the information that we had and how that information led us to make the decisions that we made um, and the outcomes that we came to can also abide by the truthfulness rule, uh, which says that communication is honest and candid. So even if you have bad news to share with your employees, it's much better to share the bad news than it is to lie to them or try to hide information. Because if employees find out that the information they had was um, deceptive or dishonest, it's certainly going to influence whether or not they think the organization is fair, it's definitely going to have an impact on whether or not they think they can trust the people um, in charge. So again, in order to display informational justice, we need to provide justification for our decisions, but we also need to make sure that the information we're sharing is truthful. Informational justice in particular is really important when organizations are making decisions um, that have the potential to influence employees. So there was one study, it's kind of a novel study, uh, where there was an organization that had three different locations. And at the three different locations, um, they were able to to kind of impose different experimental conditions in order to look at how informational justice affects employees' behaviors. So um, what they found uh, at one organization, they basically had no pay cuts at all. Um, so employees just continued working like normal business as usual. In the second location, they told employees that they were going to be getting a pay cut, uh, and they gave a very short, impersonal explanation for the pay cut. They basically said, sorry, times are tough, we have to cut your salary, and that's all we know. Okay, and, and that's it, right? In the third condition, employees received a pay cut, but they were given a long and a sincere explanation for the pay cut. So right now we're going through an economic downturn. One way to ensure that everyone keeps their jobs is by reducing pay for the short term. It's really for the good of the company. We're really sorry, etc. So they gave much more informative, long explanations. So what this graph is showing us is um, this is the time before and after the pay cut, and this is uh, reported employee theft. Um, as a result. So here in the no pay cut condition, this blue line, it's pretty flat. So these individuals had no change in their pay. So their theft 
rate um, before, during, after this experiment was basically the same. For employees that got the short impersonal explanation, you can see that before the pay cut, um, theft was pretty low. But during the pay cut, these employees are mad, right? They haven't really gotten an explanation. Informational justice is really lacking. And so, yowza, we see um, employee theft really skyrocket. And then after, when the pay cut goes you know, back to normal and now people are making their money, we see that the theft has reduced. But look at this green line. The green indicates the organization that had the long, sincere explanation for the pay cut. So in this instance, individuals um, before, again, we see really no difference in these companies about theft um, before this decision was announced. Here we see that when given a long, sincere explanation for the pay cut, um, yes, theft is higher than in the company where there was no pay cut, but it's considerably less, significantly less than in the organization where they were given um, a, you know, a short explanation for the pay cut. So in this instance, when we're giving out bad news, when we have to make changes to the organization that our employees might not like, um, one way that we can help minimize the damage or the bad outcomes associated with those decisions is by relying on informational justice and giving employees long, sincere, honest explanations for why we've had to take the measures we've taken uh, and really trying to explain to them from our perspective. And in doing so, employees might not like it, right? they might not be able to change it, but they might also be less likely to um, inflict you know, lasting serious damage on the organization. Okay, so... Um, again, in the front half of this module, we talked about trust and what trust um, can look like. So there's three different types of trust. And now um, we've just talked about the four different types of justice. So as a refresher, the four types of justice uh, that we talked about um, distributive, procedural, interpersonal, and informational, those basically explain how fairly employees are treated by authorities. So how authority figures go, make, go about making decisions influences whether or not employees perceive that they're being treated fairly. So are their outcomes fair? Are the process fair? Are they being treated fairly um, interpersonally with respect? And are they being given all the information that they need? Even more, all four types of justice that we just described are strongly and positively related to trust perceptions. So what that means is as a manager, as a supervisor, as a CEO, if you display distributive, procedural, interpersonal, and informational justice, if you follow these rules that we've talked about, uh, employees are going to perceive you to be much more trustworthy compared to someone who does not follow um, those justice rules and does not display fair decision making. So this helps us to understand how these two concepts are related. Uh, in the remaining part of the module, you will learn about ethics and what it means to engage in ethical behavior and the factors that um, influence whether or not somebody does engage in ethical behavior. And of course, you'll come to see um, how ethical behavior influences perceptions of justice, which influence perceptions of trust. Okay, thanks for listening. I hope um, you found this information um, to be intriguing and to be interesting and also to be applicable to your own situations. If you have any questions about the content, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right, take care.